Welcome to the Renaissance Church Podcast. Our mission is to glorify God and to make disciples by bringing the gospel into all of life in all the earth. This is Chris Kipp, lead pastor of Renaissance Church here in Richmond, Texas. And if you've not joined us in a worship gathering or at a house church yet, we would love to have you join us. You can find out more information at rin-church.org. And I pray that you are encouraged and edified by the proclamation of God's word today. So we started a series a couple weeks ago called We Want You Here. And I've told you kind of where that came from. There was a pastor by the name of John Tyson that was in town leading a prayer service on the opposite side of Houston, you know, an hour from here. And um, I just got to go and listen to him. And he talked about making our lives a Bethany. It's, it was a special place in the ministry of Jesus where um, Jesus' best friends lived. And it was a place that embodied the spirit of like, we want you here, Jesus, And so we've been talking about that. In the first week, we talked about uh, community. And we looked at the prayer of Jesus in John 17, where he prays for our oneness. And in that prayer, it's like the, the Father, Son, and Spirit are saying to us, like, we want you here, like in community, one together, like we just prayed for. The, the second week, last week, we, uh, we, we talked about our desire for God. Like, we want you here delighting in the Lord. And this week, I want to talk about a third dimension of, of this phrase, we want you here. And I just want to talk about this, telling the good story. Telling the good story. And it's perfect that Steve shared that announcement about Kairos. They're telling the good story of Jesus in prisons. Beautiful. Telling the good story. I I will never forget the very first time that another believer challenged me as a young man on a college campus to go out and share my faith. And if you've ever done that before, it's it's a mixture of like uh, intimidation and absolute dread. Okay. The very first time you're like, (gasps) like your knees are knocking. You're like, oh my gosh. And my prayer honestly was, may there be no one in the quad today, Lord Jesus, please. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm, I don't want to say it wrong. I, I don't want to like, you know, what's going to happen is I'm going to share with them and they're going to know more about Christianity than I do. And then they're going to like reduce me to rubble, you know, in the quad. And it's just going to be, you know, terrible. And they'll never know Jesus. Like I had all the fears. And if you've ever felt that way, when it comes to telling the good story, when it comes to sharing your faith, you're, you're in good company. Okay. We've all felt the, the fear, the intimidation of, you know, how do I actually tell someone else about my faith in Christ. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things that if we're honest, it, it feels like the thing that we all know that we should do, but rarely do we actually do it. Rarely do we actually do it. I uh, was reading some surveys about you know Christians in America, and I want to say that maybe less than four percent of believers have shared their testimony you know within the last month or two. Right? It's it's very low. Very few of us are actually telling the good story. And here's the thing: is our faith is by its very essence, it's it's a missionary faith. Jesus before he left the earth, said, go and make disciples. He said, preach the gospel to all creation. And he has this message that he wants to get out. And here's the thing, rather than like a booming voice from the sky that would like declare it every month or two, like he could do if he wanted to, right? His chosen means is people like you and me to actually talk about him. That's the way that he planned this thing out. Plan A, how am I going to get my message out? I'm going to give it to my people, and then they're going to tell other people. And I know what you're thinking. Chris, that's your job. You're in ministry. You're a pastor. You go tell them, Chris. Well, here's the thing. Ephesians 4 says that he's given some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. And the work of ministry includes us, you, and me talking about 
our faith in Jesus, telling the good story. So I, I want to look at one of my favorite stories in the Bible. It's in Acts chapter 8. I think it's so rich. So if you want to go to Acts chapter 8 with me, we're going to look at uh, something that happened in the life of the early church. We're going to start in verse 26, and I'll give you a, a bit of backstory. So the day of Pentecost has already come. The Spirit has come. The, the sound of a rushing wind, the tongues of fire on the head have appeared. Peter has stood up, and he's declared this message, and 3,000 people have come to faith. And then we, we read about they were gathering in the temple courts and house to house, and, and it's just growing. This new church in Jerusalem is growing, and daily is being added to their number those who believe believe in Jesus. But then persecution breaks out against the church. And they have to be scattered out. Like they're, they're kind of running for their lives. And as they're going, they're telling the message. And one of the people that is scattered is this guy named Philip. And we're going to read about Philip in verse 26 of chapter 8. Here's what it says. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. Wow. That's amazing. Get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert road. So he got up and went. There was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch and high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to worship in Jerusalem and was sitting in his chariot on his way home, reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. The Spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. When Philip ran up to it, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? How can I, he said, unless someone guides me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the scripture passage he was reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb is silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will describe his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Verse 34, the eunuch said to Philip, I ask you, who is the prophet saying this about, himself or someone else? Verse 35, Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning with that scripture. As they were traveling down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? By the way, this was the desert road. So that's actually kind of a, a miraculous occurrence that they find water. Verse 37, Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. So he ordered that the chariot to stop. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him any longer, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip appeared in Azotus, and he was traveling and preaching the gospel in all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. So we have this incredible account that happens in the life of the early church as the gospel is just beginning to be you know, shared and spread and the church is being persecuted and scattered and all this incredible stuff is happening. And I just want to just point out that this is an amazing story. I mean, to have an angel of the Lord speak to you is an amazing thing. Like, I, I doubt that that happened to you this week. And if it did, please like, send me an email or something and let me know because I want to know that story. The angel speaks to him. And then it later it says, the spirit speaks to him. So now directly, the Lord is directly speaking to him. Hey, go over there next to that chariot. Like that's double wow. Angel, spirit, whoa, so cool. And then at the end, there's like this Holy Spirit time travel thing going on. Like it's just crazy. Like Philip baptizes a guy. And when the guy comes out of the water, Philip's like, gone. And he, it's like, it would be like from here to Pearland. It's just like you're walking here, talking, sharing the gospel, and then boom, wait a minute, I'm in Pearland. And it's just like this crazy thing happened, and, and I don't know how to explain that, except God. So it's, it's an amazing story. But there's this phrase in verse 35. Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus. That phrase, 
to tell him the good news, it, it comes from a Greek word that is euangelizo. Euangelizo. And I'm probably not saying that exactly right, but I've tried, okay? I listened to a recording this week. Euangelizo. It's transliterated in our language. We just, we, we didn't have an, a, a word specifically for that. So we just said it's evangelize. That's the word. Evangelize. We just transliterated that word. Evangelize. And here's the thing is that word evangelical carries a lot of baggage these days, doesn't it? Especially in an election year. Sometimes we're like, I am an evangelical but then you're like, but sometimes like, I'm not sure that I am an evangelical, right? But in the, like, the technical sense of the word, it's to tell the good news, to tell the good news. The, the other word that we use is the word gospel. We say that word a lot, gospel. Where does that come from? Well, it actually comes from an Anglo-Saxon word that was God spell, God spell. And here's what it meant. Good story. That was a good story. God spell. Spell and it became, uh, you know, the, the, the way that we refer to the good story, the good news of Jesus, to tell him the good news about Jesus. And what I love most about this passage, okay, the angel of the Lord leads Philip down this road. By the way, Philip is already, he's, he's there wanting to tell the good news. He wants to do this. And the angel speaks and says, go that way. And he starts walking that way. And he doesn't know like, and then what, right? I, I don't know. The angel said, go that way. I'm going to go that way. He goes that way. And then he gets to this area. And then the spirit says, go next to that chariot. And then he has this amazing encounter with this Ethiopian eunuch. And here's what I, I just want to point out is in, in this moment, the we that once you hear it's, it's God, the father and the spirit and the son and all the host of heaven working with human beings to say to a person who is far from Christ right now to say, we want you here. It's the third dimension of this phrase. Us saying with the heart of God to people who don't know Christ, we want you, people that don't know Christ yet, we want you here in the kingdom of God. We want you here. Because we think missions and telling my testimony and sharing tracts, that's the stuff that I do for God, right? Right? And here's the truth. That's the stuff that God's already doing, and he's inviting you to join him. Missions is what God is doing. And he's saying, come on, guys, let's go together. And that's a powerful paradigm shift if you really begin to understand that. Missions and evangelism is not what you're going to go do for him to show him how great you are, how awesome of a Christian you are, right? It's what God's already doing. And he's inviting us. The first thing I think we, we need to understand about uh, this, this passage is that evangelism occurs when your testimony meets a God-ordained opportunity. It's what happens when your testimony meets a God-ordained opportunity. God tees up the whole thing. Isn't that awesome? Go down that way. Go next to the chariot. He tees up an opportunity, and here's the cool thing is in verse 28, we saw that this guy is there, and he is just reading the Bible. He's reading a scroll of the prophet Isaiah out loud. I mean, what an incredible moment just to walk into that. We have a phrase that we use, it's called a divine appointment. Have you ever talked about that? A divine appointment. It's where God has something on your calendar that you don't have on your calendar. It's like he penciled something in. You, you had no idea, but boom, it's like a neighbor begins to open about their, uh, you know, they open up about their life or a coworker or, or that family member calls you. And it's like something happens. A door is opened all of a sudden. And it was that Kairos moment that Steve was talking about. It was the time. It was God's timeline. It was a divine appointment. He put it on your calendar. You had no idea. It was a God-ordained 
opportunity. And what I love about the passage is that this man is puzzling over this. He doesn't understand what he's reading, and his curiosity creates the opportunity that's the God-ordained moment. A few years ago, I was visiting Cuba with some other church planters, and we got to go to a village there, and we were going to go and share the gospel with people in the village. And again, um, not only is there like, oh gosh, okay, yeah, okay, we're going to go share the gospel, like I'm, I'm gearing up for that, right? And then, but then we're going to also translate it with somebody. And if you've ever, you know, spoken through a translator, it's like you have one or two sentences and you don't want to waste them, right? Because they're going to translate them after that. So you're just like, I'm going to try to say this as best as I can, as clear as I can. So you're feeling like, ah, oh, you know, I hope I can say this right. In that particular day, Jehovah's Witnesses were also out all throughout this area. They had a very distinct dress type of style of clothing. They had big crosses. They had, you know, their Bibles out. And just so you know, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are not uh, Christians in the sense that, that we are. Um, and I don't mean any disrespect if that's your family background. I'm not trying to be rude, but they, um, they don't believe in the deity of Christ, that he is, he is actually the highest created being, but he is not uh, the, the co-eternal son of God. So it's a lowering of the deity of Christ. And their Bible is actually changed to reflect that. So this is not the true gospel of Jesus that they're sharing. And by the way, when they come to your house and they're beautiful, sweet people, very sincere, but they're not telling you the whole truth, just so you know, Okay. And so we're there, and there's a swarm of Jehovah's Witnesses, and I'm like, oh my gosh, what is good? Like, I, this feels like this crazy battle, a spiritual battle going on right now. So we, we start walking the streets, and of course, you know, you talk to people, and they're kind of like, hey, yeah, whatever, you know, no thanks. But then finally, we, we meet this beautiful two ladies, Mercedes and Victoria. And we walk up, and I use what you use when you're overseas, you say, hi, I'm Chris, and I'm from Texas. Now, when you're from Texas, it's a whole nother thing. If you're American, they're like, oh, whatever. But if you're Texan, they're like, oh, okay, cool. So I'm, I'm, I'm using Texan to my advantage, right? And I ask them, can I share my story with you? Sure. So I begin to share my testimony of how Jesus changed my life, what he's done, and then what Jesus has done for us on the cross and raising from the dead. And I'm thinking inside, this is the lamest testimony ever, right? Like, I'm like, this is not going very well, honestly. And at the end, I say, would you like to receive what Christ has done for you and put your faith and trust in him as God? And they looked at each other, and they looked back at me, and with tears in their eyes, they said, yes. Whoa. See, the thing was, I was there with these guys. I knew we we're going to go share the gospel. I had no idea who in the world is going to actually listen to us. And it's going to be so lame when I do share. Like, I doubt anyone's going to respond. But boom, these girls open their hearts to trust in Jesus. It was an amazing moment where a God-ordained opportunity met with my testimony. The second thing that I think we should understand from this passage is that evangelism, it reveals Jesus by connecting the dots. There's this phrase in verse 30 that I think is so important. It says that when Philip ran up to the chariot, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? And I just want to focus on this one little phrase, he heard him. Because what I found is that telling the good story actually begins not with telling, but with listening. It begins with listening. And so this guy, this Ethiopian, is there. He he's, believes already in God. He's come to worship in Jerusalem. He knows nothing about Jesus. He's reading it out loud. And Philip goes, and he just hears him. He listens first. I, I was uh, reminded of this quote from Francis Schaeffer, who's an amazing, uh, he was an amazing man. He's passed away. He was talking about evangelism, and he said this. If I have only an hour with someone, 
I will spend the first 55 minutes asking questions and finding out what is troubling their heart and mind. And then in the last five minutes, I will share something of the truth. That is beautiful. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to listen. And all Philip does in this passage is he connects the dots. Really, you're reading this, you're puzzling over this passage from Isaiah. Is that about, you know, him or about someone else? And all he does is like, oh yeah, that's connected to this. And he begins to share the story of Jesus. He tells the good story of Jesus by connecting the dots. In evangelism, all we're doing is connecting the dots for people. Um, We do kind of a dorky thing as a family. I'll just say it. You know, we still sit down almost every single night and watch a show together before bed. I don't know why. It kind of started during COVID when we were just, you know, at the house all the time. And just kind of continued. So we just like, we, we love this little little house on the prairie kind of vibe that we have in our household, okay? And so we watch these shows together. And because I'm a dorky pastor, uh, you know, in every, almost every movie, I'm like, you see that villain in the story? That's like the devil, <laughs> right? And, you know, and, and you see that the, the, the hero of the story, you see how they sacrificed themselves? They, they, they sacrificed themselves for the good of other people. That's like Jesus, right? And I'm like always connecting the dots between what they're watching and what, you know, the gospel of Jesus is because here's the thing, you know this, like when you, you know, sit in church or, or you read the Bible, a lot of times you're, you're hearing this stuff, you're reading a scripture, but there's not the, the heart connection. There's something like the, the, the video, the story, the music, all that stuff connects us emotionally with what's happening. And we forget that this is just really, it's, it's like a microcosm of the big story of God. So we're just connecting the dots And I connect the dots for my kids so they hear the gospel over and over again. We're just connecting the dots. The the, the third thing is this. Evangelism isn't high-pressure selling. It's spirit-led telling. Have you ever been in a car dealership trying to buy a car before? If you're a car salesman, I love you. I'm not trying to be mean to you right now. But you know that feeling. You like the car, but you got to work out the price. And you go sit in the office and you're like, I think I want this for that. I got to talk to my manager, right? Back and forth. And then the heat is on. They put the light in your face. Are you going to sign the dotted line? Are you going to get this? You know, you feel like the high pressure thing. And I think sometimes when it comes to sharing our story or telling the good news, a lot of times we feel like we've got to like get someone to sign the dotted line. We're going to corner them into the gospel. And I just want to say, please be free of that in the name of Jesus. That is not what we're about. It's not what we're doing. We're not high pressure salesmen. Nobody wants to be a Jesus salesman, Right? Jesus is his own salesman. He is so good. What he's done for us is so amazing. All we're doing is just talking about it, how it's changed our life. Um, I found this, this infographic. I think I have this on a slide, Zach. If you want to go to that, it says at the top, generational differences in faith sharing. I think there's one more slide that has it more zoomed in, and I'll just kind of read off. This was uh, from, I think it's the Barna Research Group, and they were looking at, you know, kind of generational differences in attitudes about telling the good story. And that first one, it's kind of hard to see. It says, part of my faith means being a witness about Jesus. And what's so cool is like across the board from millennials to Gen X to boomers to elders, like almost everybody, 96, 97, 95, 95, almost everybody says part of my faith as a believer in Jesus is telling the good story to tell other people about it. That next line. It's, it's even strong, right? It's, it's the best thing that could ever happen to someone is for them to come to know Jesus. Again, like almost everybody's like, yeah, 94%, 97%, 97%, 97%. Like almost 100% of people said the best thing that could ever happen to anyone is to come to know 
Jesus. That's, that's really positive stuff. But then this second to last one, this is where it kind of got a little bit weird to me. It says, it is wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in hopes that they will one day share the same faith as you. 47% of millennials said, it is wrong for me to share my faith with you, hoping that you will someday share the same faith that I have. And that to me was such a disconnect. 96% said, part of my faith means being a witness about Jesus. 94% said, the best thing that could ever happen to you is to come to know Jesus. And then 47% of them said, but it's wrong to tell them. What is going on in our culture that makes us think that it's wrong for us to tell the good story of Jesus? And here's what I think it is. I think that secularism has just eclipsed uh, scriptural conviction for many Christians. The, the spirit of the age has discipled the disciples of Jesus. The cultural value and definition of tolerance tells us that it's wrong for us to share our faith with someone in the hopes that they will convert to our faith. And let me tell you something, that is absolutely craziness. It truly is the best thing that could ever happen to anyone. And I just want to know, like, where are the spirit-led shares, the, bold, the emboldened by the Holy Spirit people who say, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And Philip, in the story, he's not trying to you know, put the pressure on this guy. He's following the Spirit's lead. The Spirit is on mission. It's incredible. The fourth thing, last thing I want to say. This is so important to understand. This is so freeing. We do the telling and God does the turning. We do the telling and God does the turning. In the story, I, I love Philip just connects the dots. Oh, he, th that actually points to Jesus. And he just kind of tells them the th whole story about Jesus, the good news. And then the guy's listening, and he, he's in the chariot, and he sees water. And he's like, what would keep me from being baptized? And Philip's like, uh, you're ready to do that? Oh, yeah, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Oh, okay, great. Let's go right now. Just amazing. Philip's just telling, but God's doing something on the inside of this person. And so when, as Philip's using his words to tell, God's actually turning this person's heart. And then let me tell you something. That is so, this is so beautiful and freeing for us as people who tell the good story of Jesus. Our responsibility, friends, is not to convert anyone. We are unable to change someone's heart. We cannot do it. It's above our pay grade. Amen? We can't do it. If I can talk you into it, someone else can talk you right out of it. Really. It is a work of God in the heart of a person, and all we do is just tell our story. We tell the good story of Jesus. D.T. Nile said it this way, Christian, Christianity is one beggar telling another beggar where he found bread. One beggar telling another beggar where he found bread. I love that. I think it speaks to our fears. What if I say it wrong? What if I leave out something What if I don't, you know, I don't have a Bible degree, so like what if it's not like, eh, totally there. And here's the beautiful thing. You can say it wrong and God can still save them because it's not about you. God does the turning. Uh, there's a, a, a lady who shares um, at big women's conferences. Um, I think her name is Jill Briscoe. 
If you've ever heard Jill Briscoe speak, she's amazing. Probably in her maybe 80s now. And um, she <laughs> tells a story about hearing the gospel from someone um, who said that, you know, behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anybody would open the door for me, I will come in and dine with him. And um, she's like, I just, I received the Lord at that moment when I heard, like, I, I got to open the door of my heart. And then as she grew in her face, she was like, oh, he's talking to, like, Christians in that moment in a church saying, like, hey, if y'all would open the door, I'd come into your church. And, like, she's like, I, I like, later realized that person totally took that verse out of context, but it worked. Isn't that amazing? God doesn't need you to quote the Bible correctly to actually do something in the heart of someone else because it's not about you. And that is so freeing because it's all about him doing the turning while we're doing the talking. You know, our friend Norman was in town and he was, shared this amazing, beautiful message about just being good news. He shared the story of, of his friend that was in the grocery store and noticed that somebody was having a rough time. And she just stopped and asked, can I hug you? And the person said yes. And she, when she hugged her, the, the woman just began to sob. And so a few weeks later, she goes back to the grocery store. And another employee of the store says, are you the hugger? She's like, ah. Uh. I think so. <laughs> maybe. Maybe I am the hugger. She's like, can I have a hug? It's like, come on. Being good news. Being good news. But you know, we also need to tell good news. There is a moment for us to use words. Amen? There's a moment where we talk, where we tell the good story. Evangelism occurs when, when your testimony meets a God-ordained opportunity. It, it reveals Jesus by listening and connecting the dots. It, it's not high-pressure selling. It's spirit-led telling. It invites a personal response because it's a personal gospel. And we can put our fears to rest knowing that it's our part simply to tell and it's God's part to do the turning. I, I just want to end with just this one verse from Acts 4, uh, verse 12. And here's what it says. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Do you believe that? There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And then he added this, and no one comes to the Father except by me. So if I'm understanding that correctly, the only way for a person to experience eternal life, to receive forgiveness of their sins, to be born again, to find light and, and truth and newness, it's not through uh, yoga, I don't think. It's not through Hinduism, if I'm hearing this correctly. It's not through Allah. It's not by, uh, you know, believing in humans and technology and we're going to just turn this thing around. It's not in whoever wins the election, okay? I think salvation only happens through Jesus Christ, period. And you know who has that story? You do. You've got that story. And if Jesus has changed your life, it's a very personal story. And it probably looks like this, right? He saved me, and then that happened, and this happened, and that happened. And here I am. And I have peace with God through Jesus. Do we believe this? We also know the other side of that coin 
we can say in the positive, those who believe in Jesus, only those who believe in Jesus will inherit eternal life. On the other side of that coin, the part that we don't really like to talk about a whole lot is the, the part that says, and those who reject Christ will suffer eternally apart from him in a place called hell. And it's eternal because none of us in our own works or efforts or anything could ever do enough to satisfy the debt that we owe to Jesus because of our sin, the debt we owe to the Father. Only Jesus' perfect life could satisfy it. And do we believe that part too? That there is a literal place called hell where people go who reject the name of Jesus, who don't know? People that are lost, those who need to be there, but they're here and they don't know the way to get there. And if we really believe that, I think the question, and this is the convicting question for my own life, I'm not trying to be hard on you, I'm trying to be hard on us, <laughs> is this, do we care? Do we care? Do we love Jesus enough? Do we love the people around us enough to take the awkward step of telling the good story? Um, there's this thing that happens on our phones. It happened yesterday. We were in the kitchen. We have multiple phones in the house and we get that like grating sound. <laughs> And it's what? what? What is that called? The Amber Alert. The Amber Alert. Um, it was actually, uh, it, it's, I think it started in 2003, but it was actually signed into law by George W. Bush in, in 2003. It's, it actually, it, it happened in response to something that happened in 1996. Uh, Amber Hagerman was a young girl. I think she was nine years old in Arlington, Texas, she goes with her brother on a bike ride, never comes home. Of course, the parents are freaking out, calling the police, calling everyone, putting out the word, if you see Amber, please let us know. And unfortunately, tragically, three days later, they found her body deceased. She had been kidnapped, um, assaulted, killed, and terrible, tragic story. And in response, they came up with this um, America's Missing broadca broad Broadcast Emergency make sure, Response. America's Missing Broadcast Emergency Response. And the tragedy provoked this idea because the idea was what if we could work together with local news agencies to alert the public when a child goes missing? And so that's why when we're in public and all the phones and the whole store just start going off, right? It's all in response to Amber Hagerman. And I was thinking about this. Amber losing her life has resulted in thousands of children being found. And that's the gospel, isn't it? Jesus lays down his life so that millions and millions of lost children could be found. God's children could be found. And I was just thinking that maybe it's time for the people of God to issue our own Amber Alert. There's people who are missing here. There's people who are not found. They, they've not found the Lord. And we have to do something about this. We have to take those awkward steps that we feel so nervous about taking. We have to engage with people that are far from him and look for the moment where we can just connect the dot. Uh, what you're asking about is really all about this. It's Jesus. He died for you. He rose again and he loves you. And so this morning, maybe you're here and you've never received that message. And I've been telling, but God's turning something inside of you. And I just want you to respond in faith to him, to put your faith in Jesus, to know that he loves you that much, he would do that for you. The father loves you that much that he would lay down his son for you. And this is, 
the invitation for you today. For those of us that do believe already in Jesus, that God's done something in our life, he's turned us around already. We believe in him. And here's what I just want to ask us to do. Would we begin to follow the Holy Spirit into spirit-led telling? To be a people who would tell the good story of Jesus. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Renaissance Church Sermon Podcast. To support our work, you can like, share, subscribe, or you can donate at rin-church.org.